So I've been meaning to make this video for a little while, and now with uh, news of Bill and Melinda Gates' recent divorce in the headlines, I figure now's as good a time as any. So a few weeks ago, I finished reading Bill Gates' new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And there's a lot to unpack here. There is a hell of a lot to unpack. So I'm going to do a review of this book. Uh, from my perspective. Now, first of all, there's a mixture of facts and bullshit in this book. There's a lot of good information uh, that's very valuable, and there's also a lot of bias. I don't think the book is necessarily lying about anything, but I do think that certain parts are taken out of context, certain important details are omitted, and some things are overemphasized, whereas others are underemphasized. Also, I think it's very convenient how all the solutions to global warming near, nearly always seem to involve Bill Gates earning more money. They always seem to involve the exact things that Bill Gates has invested in, that he owns, and that he profits from. It's very interesting how all the best solutions seem to come from there, you know, and he ignores the other solutions, which may be as good or better, that, to my knowledge, are not the things that he's personally invested in. That, right off the bat, is my most transparent criticism of the book. Also, a huge thing, right away at, at the beginning, Bill Gates says, well, it's going to be hard for all of us to uh, adapt to changing our lifestyles as a result of climate change, but I've, I've made up for my own emissions because I purchased carbon offsets to make up for the fact that me and my family jet across the world in a private jet constantly. And it's like, fuck you, man. Just because you can purchase carbon offsets to make up for flying doesn't mean everyone can. To him, those carbon offsets are nothing. That's just a few million dollars down the drain. That's no big deal to him. So basically what he's saying is that for the average person, they should have to actually change their lifestyle altogether. Uh, maybe even stop flying anywhere. But for him, like it's okay for him because he purchases carbon offsets. Like right there... That is actually unironically privileged talking right there. So right off the bat, we can kind of see how full of shit he is in that regard. Now, he doesn't flat out say in the book that people should stop flying. In fact, in most cases, he doesn't say that people should change their lifestyles to stop climate change. The vast majority of the time, all of his solutions involve new forms of technology or upgraded forms of technology so that people can basically live exactly the same lifestyles as before, but... I guess with higher taxes and higher costs for certain things based on the what he calls the green premiums, which means paying more money as a result of greener technology, uh, paying more money for the updated technology, which is more expensive to implement. Now, that's not something I inherently have a problem with. However, there is one area where he does flat out say that people do need to change their lifestyles, which is he says flat out that people need to stop eating so much meat and dairy. And he's saying that we have to eat alternatives instead. Now, of course, Bill Gates has a ton of money invested in Impossible Meat and uh, what's the other one? Beyond Meat. So yeah, very convenient there that he's saying that meat is the one thing where, where um, you know, improving, like he does mention that there are ways to make meat less environmentally unfriendly to do with like, the feeds that are given to the animals and things like that. Um, methods of uh, dealing with fertilizer, I believe, also. But at the end of the day, he says, no, that's not enough. We have to just cut down on meat or even eliminate meat entirely and replace it with this uh, fake meat shit, which he claims tastes just as good as real meat. I've never actually tried it, but from everyone I've known who's tried it, they all say that it tastes like shit that it does not taste like real meat at all. It tastes like crap. The texture is weird. The taste is weird. Everything about it sucks. Um, so blatantly right off the bat, I think he's lying and bullshitting about that. Like by claiming it'll be exactly the same. 
it's a false claim they often make, you know? It's it's just like when modernist architects say like, oh, well, don't worry about us tearing down this historic building because the building that we replace it with will be just as beautiful. It's like, no, it, it won't be. It'll probably look like shit. And it's the same case as with this fucking impossible shit burger. Now, he also mentions dairy, but he doesn't at all explain how we're supposed to, uh, like, what kind of substitute for dairy we're supposed to have. He, he simply, dairy is almost an afterthought to him. And it's like, I don't know, like, is he talking about, like, margarine? Like, what's he talking about? Like, almond milk, margarine, uh, fucking, like, well, I don't know what kind of fake cheese there is. I don't even want to know. But, like, frankly, it's like, okay... He doesn't even go into detail on that, and he's supposed to expect us to take it for granted, like, oh, we're going to stop eating meat and dairy, and then eat fake shit instead, and he won't even explain for dairy what the fake shit is. He only explains that for meat. And look, I've as I've said before, um, like, I actually did a poll am among a bunch of friends of mine, and they're the vast majority agreed that of all the things we're being asked to change or give up because of climate change, meat and dairy are the one thing that they would be least likely to give up. The one thing that they would, um, that they would say you can pry it from my cold dead hands, you know, meat and dairy, I think, and I agree with that. Like meat and dairy to me are the last things that, that should be, um, banned or suppressed. Like of all the possible things in which we could possibly change our lifestyle. I think that's the last one. And I think it's because, well, look at fucking vegans. They're all emaciated looking. They look scrawny, emaciated, unhealthy. They look like they just were liberated from Auschwitz, basically. Like, that's that's kind of how they look. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg. I mean, enough said, right? Just look at her. Yeah, so, I mean, like, honestly, vegans, they look like they have HIV, like, that's what they look like. And I mean, in some cases, they probably do. But I mean, by and large, though, it's, it's just not a healthy lifestyle. People need meat and dairy. And nothing in this book convinces me that his shitty substitutes will A, taste anywhere near as good, or B, provide the necessary nutrients. So that's one of my biggest issues right there. And he talks about cow farts so fucking much. He even says that Melinda was sick of him talking about cow farts constantly. And I can't help but wonder if that's part of the reason why they're getting a divorce now. He probably like made her dress up as a cow in bed and was like, fart like a cow, baby, fart like a cow. Like he's so obsessed with fucking cow farts that it, it seems to border on like a sexual fetish. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, like just just constantly just cow farts cow farts but does he talk you know what he doesn't talk about almost at all in this fucking book he does not talk about suburbia even once he only talks very briefly about the idea he, there's literally i remember there were two sentences in the entire book devoted to the idea of 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 better urban planning but he doesn't even specifically call out suburbia as being the problem now Two sentences versus, oh, who even knows how many fucking on and on about cow farts? Like, who, who even knows how many pages of the book were devoted to cow farts? A lot. Um, he also barely mentions, I think only one or two sentences in the entire book talk about SUVs as a problem or big passenger vehicles in general, which will continue to be a problem even with electric cars because guess what? They use more electricity. And guess what? electricity is not an infinite resource nothing is 100 percent non-renew is nothing is 100 percent renewable uh james howard kunstler's book too much magic goes into a lot of detail about why this is um like even wind and solar plants the materials they're built out of are not 100 percent renewable so yeah, I mean, he completely sidesteps the suburbia question and the car question. He never once, not even one sentence in the entire book is devoted to the idea that we need more mass transit. Like he talks about how it's good that some places are making their buses more environmentally friendly by changing the fuels on the buses, but he never even once suggests that as a society, we need to rely more on mass transit and less on cars. I don't think he mentions trains even once in the entire fucking book. So that right there shows me that he's ignoring 
A, one of the things that will help the most because he actually admits in the book that transportation is the number one cause of emissions in the USA, which actually is not true in the world as a whole. To me, that indicates that the suburbia problem, the the car dependence problem is largely an American problem, also Canadian and Australian. But, and that would be like, he talks about how the nations that pollute the most are the ones that are res- most responsible and need to cut down on their pollution first. But he completely ignores the fact that what is the key factor that makes Americans pollute more and Canadians and Australians pollute more? Well, it's our suburban lifestyles. That's frankly what it is. Um, you see, Bill Gates, he divides carbon emissions into five categories. Um, how we get around, so transportation, uh, how we grow things, and that would include meat and uh, vegetables and whatever. Uh, how we heat and cool ourselves, so like uh, air conditioning and uh, heating how we manufacture things. And now manufacturing is actually the biggest cause of emissions worldwide. Um, And finally, how we get our power. Now the interest, like electricity, like the interesting thing is suburbia, I believe probably contributes to four out of five of these. Uh, It definitely contributes to how we get around because suburbia for obvious reasons encourages car dependence uh, because just the layout, the low density makes it very hard for mass transit to be viable. Never even mind walking. Um, it contributes toward heating and cooling emissions because the bigger your house is, the more energy you're using to heat and cool it. That's pretty obvious. It contributes to manufacturing, I actually believe, not only because the house itself takes up more materials in its construction, But also because, frankly, the bigger your house is, the more shit you're probably going to buy. Because people don't like the feeling of having an empty house. And those who own huge houses are probably more likely to buy more random shit to fill up the house. So that's more manufacturing. And the fourth category that it fits into is um, electrical power. Because bigger homes use more electricity, uh, especially for lighting. And also for various other things, you know, various other functions within the house. Like the bigger the house, the more electricity it uses. The only one it doesn't really fit into is the agricultural category, how we grow things, as Bill Gates calls it. I don't think having a big house necessarily is linked to eating more. Although it could be because suburbanites tend to be fatter. Although that's because they get less exercise and they drive everywhere. They don't walk as much. But do suburbanites actually eat more? I am not sure about that. So I'm going to say that's an iffy one there. I guess they have more space in their homes to store a whole shitload of food. So maybe. But that one's iffy. But the other four are all, in my opinion, connected to suburban sprawl. So that would be a huge solution that he completely ignores. And like a lot of other books I've read do focus heavily on suburbia as a cause of and car dependence as a cause of of carbon emissions uh to uh james howard kunstler several of his books uh too much magic the long emergency uh some books by andres duani and several other authors such as uh suburban nation and walkable city um oh yeah also the geography of nowhere by by james howard kunstler So that's a huge cause of carbon emissions right there that Bill Gates completely ignores and doesn't want to talk about. Probably because he doesn't have any money invested in it. Like, new urbanism isn't profitable to Kunstler. Mass transit, I'm sorry, not Kunstler, to Bill Gates. Um, Yeah, Bill Gates, it's not profitable to Bill Gates, so he does not talk about it. Um... He doesn't talk about mass transit. He doesn't talk about, like, denser communities. And again, it doesn't have to be, like, Hong Kong level dense. But, like, you know, there's a certain minimum density threshold to make mass transit viable. It doesn't even have to be, like, apartment buildings everywhere. It could be townhouses. It could even be, like, denser detached homes. Just, it can't be, like, the current suburban sprawl, though. It has to be denser than that. But no, Bill Gates doesn't talk about that at all, at all. 
So there's that issue. And um, yeah, overall, like, as I said, yeah, I think he emphasizes the wrong things. Also, he places too much emphasis. He specifically says, well, Western countries have to be the ones to bear the brunt of the changes at first because we have to set the example because we pollute the most. But he ignores the fact that China's carbon emissions per capita are as bad or worse uh, compared to many European nations right now. So really, the only Western nations that actually stand out are the USA, Canada, and Australia. But he actually never really singles out those three nations. He kind of completely ignores the fact that European carbon emissions are nowhere near as high as those three countries. So it's like, I mean, frankly, he does seem to kind of be just propagating the whole anti-white narrative by implying that, like, it is developed countries and by that he means white countries basically plus i guess maybe japan or south korea or taiwan that are like responsible chiefly but at the same time he ignores the fact that as i said like china's carbon emissions are per capita are on par with those of europe and china is actually getting a lot worse year by year whereas europe is kind of level so really i mean i think bill gates like you know, he, he's going to piss off a lot of people with this in, insinuation that it's, it's the West's fault and that the West is re- the ones responsible who have to change everything. But it's like, why? Like, why, why is Sweden any more obligated to change their lifestyle than China? They don't admit more per capita than China. So why? Like, I mean, frankly, it is an anti-white double standard. Uh, like, if you want, if he wants to single out Canada, U.S., and Australia, by all means, but it's not fair to lump Europe in with them and to simply let China off the hook. Uh, it's not fair at all. And frankly, this ties into like the wider anti-white narrative, and I think this is part of the reason why so many people on the right uh, hold on to this idea that global warming is a complete hoax or man-made global warming is a complete hoax. And I don't, I don't agree with that at all. But at the same time, it's like, I can understand why people feel that way because people like Bill Gates constantly push the right in that direction as a knee jerk reaction because they always keep propagating these anti-white narratives. And frankly, it's like if they really want everyone to be on board with the environmental movement and if they don't want it to be a partisan issue, then they need to stop with this fucking anti-white rhetoric. Like, they need to stop blaming Europe for carbon emissions just because they're white while letting China completely off the hook. It's fucking bullshit. So anyway, there's that. I guess... The one thing I'll give Bill Gates a lot of credit for in this book, the one thing I will say he's pretty good on is that he's not anti-nuclear. He actually does support nuclear energy, which I agree with. And I think part of the reason is, frankly, because he's a dude. Because if statistically, as I've shown in the past, with statistics I've linked to, um, women tend to be much more against nuclear power than men. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is true even when you control for political affiliation. And I think it has something to do with the female psychology. I think like women are more risk averse than men and women are very obsessed with the idea of harm reduction. And this whole risk aversion, when they see a nuclear plant, all they think of is Chernobyl. All they think of is like the potential, the one in a million chance of a horrific meltdown. And... Again, it's like, even if it's for the greater good, I think a lot of women, the way their brains work, they don't think of the greater good. They think of the worst possible outcome. So they're like very, I think women are very risk avoidant as a rule compared to men, which is partly why men often support things that are a bit more like scientifically innovative or groundbreaking uh, because men are more risk-taking that could be a good thing or bad thing in some cases like i mean uh there's plenty of shit that's been a huge waste of money uh in terms of scientific innovation but at the same time um it can be a good thing in a case like nuclear power where in my opinion the risk is well worth the reward 
and the benefits outweigh the very small risk of potentially negative consequences. So I'll give Bill Gates credit in that regard, that he's not anti-nuclear. Um, and he does, he does admit that solar and wind by themselves are not enough because they're unreliable. And any energy grid that at least partially relies on solar and wind needs to be supplemented with nuclear, hydroelectric, or even fossil fuels. Like he actually doesn't say that we should get rid of fossil fuels 100%. Like he talks about net zero, but his implication is that by planting trees and by using carbon capture technology, we can offset for the emissions that we do produce. So net zero doesn't mean literal zero, it means net zero. Um, whether or not net zero is a realistic goal, I'm not sure. But my point is, I mean, at least Bill Gates is realistic enough to understand that we cannot have an energy grid that is 100% solar and wind, which is what some environmentalists, to be honest, mostly women, seem to believe. Again, it's it's this idealistic risk averse. Well, it's actually very risky because it risks completely um, destroying society. But I mean, risk averse in the sense like, oh, no meltdowns. Oh, Chernobyl, Fukushima. Oh, no, people are going to die. You know, like that kind of risk aversion, I think, is a very feminine trait. And I will give Bill Gates credit for his masculine thinking, at least in this one particular area. So yeah, I guess those are my thoughts on Bill Gates' book. Um, I guess read it if you're interested, sure, but just be discerning, that's what I would say.